So thank you for joining me this morning. We are gonna walk through DocuSign from opportunity to compliance. So we're gonna walk through confirming our NRDS ID number, accessing GAR forms, updating them, sending them for signature, and uploading them into command. As I'm going throughout the training, please interrupt me with any questions. Unmute yourself, ask a, a question uh, in the chat box. I wanna make sure that you walk away from this uh, feeling a lot more knowledgeable and comfortable using uh, DocuSign. So I am gonna jump right in. So I'm gonna go to my opportunity that I've created. So I'm gonna click on the opportunities icon over here on the left-hand side, the two hands shaking. And then I personally like to go to the all opportunities tab to find the opportunity that I've created. And here's the one that I have for today. It's 1234 Main Street Northeast dash Stark slash POTS dash listing. So for today's training, we're gonna walk through a listing. Uh, and the reason I choose to do a listing is because I wanna walk through uh, the disclosures that we send out as a part of our listing agreement. You can see here, um, my name, my opportunity name is set up in a specific way, and that's based on what the MCA office has uh, recommended that we list our name, our opportunities, so that way as they are going through and confirming checks and documents that everything matches and it's easy for them to identify which property that contract is for. I've also included the property information here within command. And the reason it's important to fill this information out is because DocuSign does pull in some of that information directly out of command. So the more information you can put into command means the less information you have to add once you get into DocuSign. So now that I have my opportunity all set up, I'm gonna click on Documents. And in the right-hand corner over here, you'll see this big blue button that says start, a, I guess that's kind of like a dark bluish black button that says start a transaction. It is very important when you are going through the process that you click start a transaction from within command. By clicking start a transaction here, you are going to link this opportunity in command to the room that you're about to create in DocuSign. And by having that connection, you will then be able to upload documents directly from DocuSign into command. That's gonna be one of the main benefits of having or of using DocuSign versus RDocs or .loop or any other e-signature platform. So it saves you that hassle of having to download those documents directly to your computer and then uploading them manually into command. So once you're in here, I click on start a transaction. So I'm gonna click on that. And that's gonna open up DocuSign in a new browser window. If for whatever reason you have pop-up blockers on your computer, double check to make sure that it isn't preventing uh, DocuSign from uh, opening. If you have a little box here, a little red box in the URL bar of your browser, that will let you know if you have, more often than not let you know if you have that pop-up blocker on. So I'm gonna log in using the account that I have connected to DocuSign. So I'm gonna click log in. And DocuSign is going to draw me into my new room that I've just created in the documents tab of that room. And the reason I know that it is the same room is because I come up here to the top right hand corner of the page and here is my room name, 1234 Main Street Northeast dash Stark slash POTS dash listing. And that's the same name as my opportunity in command. That's one way you will know that they're linked. Another way um, you'll know they're linked is the expected closing date of 12, 15, 20. So that is a piece of information that I added when I was creating the opportunity. So again, just more information that um, I don't have to add later on that's already directly, that's already come directly from DocuSign. So now that we're in DocuSign, if this is your first time in the system, before you do anything else, I recommend that you confirm your NRDS ID number. By confirming that number, you are letting the system know that you have access to those GAR forms. So I don't wanna, I wanna go ahead and do that now, so that way when we get kind of further into the process, we're not having to go back and forth. So if this is your first time in the system, 
there are two ways that you can confirm your NRDS ID number. We'll walk through both of them. The first one is here within the Documents tab of DocuSign. And you can see here that the Documents tab is highlighted blue, so that's how we know we're in the Documents tab. If you come up to the Add button in the top right-hand corner, and then select DocuSign Forms, you'll receive this pop-up window where it has these two icons, our two logos. We'll click on the Realtor logo for the National Association of Realtors. And then here, it's gonna ask for our NRDS ID number. And more than likely, you don't know your NRDS ID number. I've only met two agents that do. So right below it, uh, right below the text field, it says find your NRDS ID. So I'm gonna click on that. And that's gonna open up this handy dandy little uh, NAR page where I can either use my last name, email ad address, and or real estate license number to find my NRDS ID. So I'm gonna click on last name and real estate license because I can't remember which email address I used when I created um, my profile for the Atlanta uh, Realtor Association. So then click submit and it will show you your NRDS ID number. So just highlight this number here right mouse click and click copy. And I'm done with this tab, I don't need any more, so I'm gonna close it out and go directly back into DocuSign. And I'm gonna paste in my NRDS ID number. Make sure that my last name is the same that's on my real estate license. So if you've been married or divorced or had any name changes, you'll wanna double check and make sure that all of your records for your license number, as well as your ARA membership and REC information all have the same last name. If there is um, a difference in your last names between any of those uh, profiles, the system won't be able to confirm your NRDS ID. And now I'm going to select from the drop down which association I'm a member of, which is the Georgia Association of Realtors. So I'm just going to scroll all the way to the bottom, and then the Georgia Association of Realtors is about 15th from the bottom. So I'm going to click on that. I'll click on validate. It now says you are validated on two associations. If this is your very first time confirming your NRDS ID, you also have another pop-up here from the Georgia Association of Realtors, which says um, that you accept the terms and conditions of uh, using the GAR forms. Now, when you see this window where it says add DocuSign forms and select library, that's how you know that you've confirmed your NRDS ID. The second way that you can confirm your NRDS ID is up in the top right hand corner. If you see your image or your initials, if you click on that, scroll down to preferences from that drop down menu. And then in the menu on the left hand side, we'll click on integrations and scroll down just a little bit and we'll see NRDS ID information. And you can confirm that here. Since I've already confirmed it, it has my information filled in here, but if you didn't have it, um, had, if you had not yet confirmed it, where this clear button is, it will have that find my NRDS ID link, and you can click on that to then use your email address, last name, and, and license number to find that. And again, you do the same thing here. You'd paste in your ID number, your last name, and then select the Georgia Association of Realtors from the drop-down menu. Any questions on confirming your NRDS ID number? All right. I just wanna make sure that you do this before you do anything else within DocuSign. Otherwise, you won't be able to get very far. So now that we've confirmed our, num our NRDS ID, I'm gonna go back to my dashboard, so I'm gonna go back into that room where we just were. And then I'm gonna click back in the Documents tab just because I wanna pick up right where we left off. So. Whenever you click that start a transaction button in command, that's gonna take you to the documents tab in DocuSign of your new room. However, before you start adding any GAR forms to this room, we're gonna to wanna to click on the details tab and fill out that information there because it's the information on the details tab that will auto populate into our GAR forms. So I'm gonna click on details. And then in the top right hand corner, I'm going to click on the edit button. And this is going to make all the information on this page editable. Now, as I scroll down, you'll kind of see there's the, the page is kind of broken up on the uh, two thirds of the left hand side. We have information about the property. 
And then on the right third, we have information about our sellers and our buyers. So we'll fill out all, as much of the information as possible. So I just recommend start at the top and work your way down. If for whatever reason you needed to rename the room here, you can do that. There isn't really a need and I like having the opportunity name and the name of the room match so it just makes it really simple for me to keep track of those both. I'm just gonna select local currency, MLS ID, I wanna paste that in here. One thing I do wanna point out, DocuSign does not connect to the FMLS the same way that .loop does, so DocuSign will not auto-populate the information about the property and or co-op agent. You do have to manually add it, but if you add it here on the details pa page, all that information will auto-populate into uh, the documents you're using. Origin of lead, company room test, eh, you don't need to fill that in. So property address, so I'll just type that in. One, two, three, Main Street, Northeast, Atlanta, Fulton County. That's in Georgia. Postal code. Select property type. We'll do residential detached, year built, suit 2004. And there are no special circumstances. Listing date, we'll select today, 10-16. Listing expiration date, we'll do uh, 12, 18. Original listing amount, we'll do 315. Current listing amount, 315, 315. Perfect. And then we'll scroll down. Offer details, we're just about to list this house, so we don't have any offers yet, so we don't have to worry about filling that in. We don't have a high bid confirmation. We don't have any closing details or additional information. We haven't gotten that far yet in the transaction. Property details, this isn't required, so I'm not gonna fill it in. And that is all the information about the property. So I'm gonna scroll back up to the top and I'm gonna start filling in the information about my clients. So since I'm do, uh, doing a listing today for this training, you'll notice that my clients, seller one, Tony Stark, all of his contact information has been filled in. That's because this information was pulled indirectly from command. So again, one more thing that I don't have to worry about, I do always recommend that you double check your client's contact information. Nine times out of 10, DocuSign will pull this in out of command, but in the, the one time it doesn't, you wanna double check it. And if it doesn't, at the bare minimum, you need to have your client's name and email address in order for them to sign these documents. So I have name, phone number, email address for seller one. Scrolling down, we have seller two, Pepper Potts, and Pepper's email, which is just my personal one for today's training. And then we'll scroll down. Then we have listing agent one, which is myself, for pulling in uh, my phone number, my email address, my company name. And you'll see here it says Keller Williams Realty First Atlanta. I'm gonna remove realty out of the name and that's because on a couple places on the GAR forms where it has our company name, Keller Williams Realty First Atlanta is too long and it takes up too much space. So it actually goes over the text of the GAR form. And Lynn and Alita have approved us using Keller Williams First Atlanta. And if you're with the Atlanta Perimeter Office, you're approved to use KW Atlanta Perimeter. So you can update that here, address, I'll fill in the city, just want to fill in as much information as possible. So country, state, Georgia, and zip code 30342. Now I'm gonna scroll down because I wanna show you all the different fields that we have here uh, for client and contact information. So listing agent two, so if you have um, a cool listing agent, you'd fill in his or, her, his or her information here. And then scrolling down, now we have buyer one's information. So if you are working with a buyer, you'd have to scroll pretty far down this page to double check and fill in your buyer one's information, your buyer two's information, and scrolling down the buyer's agent information, so your information here. In dot, dot loop, the system would automatically add those co-op agents information you can add that co-op co agent's information here if you like. 
I just want to point out here, and I'll point out again later, I do not recommend sending any documents in dot from DocuSign for signature to a co-op agent. I 100% of the time recommend downloading those documents as PDF and emailing, emailing them over to your co-op agent. I just wanted to point that out here. So if you scroll down, we have buyer agent two. And after that, we are good to go. I had a conversation this morning um, with an agent that has more than two signers on her, on her contract. And I will show you in just a few minutes when we get uh, ready to send those out, how you can add more than two signers if you need to, to a contract. So now that we filled in all the information about the property and all the information about my clients and myself, I'm going to click save in the bottom right hand corner. And now my room has been updated with all of this information about the property. So now that we're done with the details tab, I'm going to go to the documents tab. And this is where we'll add the GAR forms to edit, to edit them and add information about the property. So since we're doing a listing today, we'll need to pull our exclusive seller listing agreement, our seller's property disclosure and community association disclosure. I also want to add the purchase and sale agreement. Now I know traditionally a listing agent wouldn't be the one to originally fill that out, but since it probably is one of the most important documents you will use in your real estate career, I want to make sure you're familiar and comfortable with using it. So to add documents to the room, click on the add button in the top right hand corner. Then I'm going to click on DocuSign Forms. If you're with the first Atlanta office, this will be the process that you go to go through for finding your documents. And I'll show you a little bit different uh, for the Atlanta Perimeter Office as well. So you'd want to select the DocuSign Forms Library, and then we'll select the Georgia Association of Realtors Library. And this is going to pull up all 180 plus GAR forms that we have access to. You have to search for the forms that you want to use. Now, I recommend that as you get comfortable using these forms that you memorize the form numbers because that'll make it a little bit easier for you to pick the correct forms. So this morning, I need the exclusive seller listing agreement. And the reason I recommend using the form numbers is because you can see here, I have three different options for listing agreements. I'm embarrassed to say that there have been a handful of times, more than I care to, <laughs> to share, where I have selected the incorrect version of the GAR form because I was too fast, I was in a hurry, trying to get up that offer in a multiple offer situation. So if you start to learn and memorize the number of the forms, it'll make it a little bit easier because you can search F101, for instance, for the seller listing agreement. So I'm gonna select the exclusive seller listing agreement the bottom left-hand corner of the, the pop-up window updates with one form selected. I'm also gonna pull the seller's property disclosure. And you can see here again, we have a handful of options here. So I'm going to select F301. Then I'm gonna select the community association disclosure, F322. And then I also want to add the purchase and sale, which is F201. And I'm going to add select that. And you can see here I have four forms selected. So I'm going to click add. And that is going to add these documents to my room. You'll notice here that when you add these documents, they're going to default into the room docs folder. Anytime you add a new document, or upload a document, or a document has been completed for signature, it will default into the room docs folder. In dot loop, we were used to setting up our folders in a certain way for compliance review. If you want to mirror that setup, or you want to organize the documents, you can create your own folders here in the documents tab. To create a folder, click on the actions button in the top right hand corner and click add folder. And then you can give your folder a name. I'm gonna break my documents out into my listing agreement documents and my um, purchase and sale documents. So I'll create a folder, listing agreements and click create. So now I have my new folder here. 
there are two ways to move documents into a folder. The first is if you roll your mouse over the doc document icon, a radio button will appear in the top left hand corner of that icon and you can select that. So I'm going to select the community association disclosure and the exclusive seller listing agreement. And whenever you select a document here, this toolbar will appear at the top of the gray area on the DocuSign screen. If you roll your mouse over the icons, it'll uh, show you what the icon does. I'm going to select the move icon. Then I'm going to select a destination folder in current room. I'm going to select the listing agreements folder and I'm going to click move. The page will reload and those two documents have now been moved into the listing agreement folder. I also need to move my seller's property disclosure and the second way that you can move documents from, from one folder to another is to roll your mouse over the document icon, click on it, and drag it into the desired folder. And it's that simple. Really quick before we start editing these documents, I wanna show uh, the other way that if you're with the Atlanta Perimeter Office that you can find your GAR forms. So you click the Add button here, select DocuSign Forms, and in this pop-up window, we would select the DocuSign Forms group. Stacy has gone through and created groups uh, of documents that are gonna be commonly used for various transactions. So if you're working with a seller, a buyer, a tenant, a landlord, then you would select the group here from this drop-down menu, and you, that would show you all of the, the common forms you would use. You would still have to find the correct forms within that group, but it'd be uh, fewer documents that you'd have to search through to find those GAR forms. The first Atlanta office doesn't have groups set up because we wanna make sure that all the agents are comfortable and familiar with using DocuSign and how to find those forms before we create those groups. So now that we have all of our documents in, the doc in our room, now we can start updating them. To update a document, all you do is click on it and open it up. We'll give the system a second. Sometimes DocuSign is a little bit slower than others. Be patient, I promise it will load. So now we have our seller's listing agreement. You can see here, the property information has already been added to the document because it was pre-filled in from the details tab. I wanna point out here that anytime there is a field that is pre-populated with information from the details tab. If you edit or delete that information from a GAR form, it will edit and delete that in, or delete that information from the details tab and thus will affect that information on every other GAR form that you have in your room. So just be really mindful about making any edits to these pre-filled in fields. So we have our property address. I'll just you know, start at the top of the document and we'll work our way down filling in all of the relevant information. So we need to add our tax ID number. Our legal description, I'm going to attach as an exhibit here too. Scroll down, our listing period. DocuSign does not have the address or calendar capability that DotLoop does, so you do have to manually type in your address. So I'm gonna type in 10-16-2020. And then we'll do listing agreement date through 12, 18, 2020. Broker's duties list price, it pulls in that 315 list price from the details tab. You will notice that it does not have a comma in the price. For whatever reason, this field is not mapped to have a comma in the number. It's not a big deal. If you add it, it will just remove it for you. Uh, and it'll be the same on the uh, purchase and sale agreement. Negotiation, seller does authorize the broker to assist in negotiations. Marketing, oh, one thing I wanna point out here as well, is as I'm going through the GAR forms today, this is not a training on how to fill in or what information to fill in on these GAR forms, it is how to use the DocuSign system. So I'm gonna put in a lot of abbreviations and quick information. Always refer to Lynn or Alita on the correct information to fill in on these GAR forms. I'm going to update for marketing. Um, we'll do FMLS, ooh, Georgia MLS, and KWLS. 
commission. I negotiated 6% and I will share half of that with the co-op agent, protected period, 90 days. I'm an independent contractor. We do not offer dual agency or sub agency. So scrolling down, there are no special circumstances. So I'll keep scrolling down. Keep scrolling. All right. Here we can select all the brochures that we'll want to include with the listing agreement. All the brochures are uploaded into DocuSign so you can search for them and you can search for them using the, the GAR form number. So let's see, ABCs, lead-based paint, we don't need to worry about that. Uh, radon pamphlet, protect yourself from selling a home. And then we have our legal description exhibit, so we'll make that exhibit A. And then special stipulations. You can just start typing your special steps here. I have received a couple questions um, from agents about how they can have their stipulations load on this document every single time. And that isn't, you're not able to do that in the DocuSign documents tab. You are able to create templates. And I have a separate class on creating templates. Um, so we can join me for that or let me know and we can set up some time to talk through that one-on-one. -on -one. So just write more stipulations here. And I'm gonna scroll down. And then you'll see here we have our clients' names and email addresses automatically pop populated. You'll notice that there aren't any places for them to sign, there's no signature fields. And that's because we won't add signature fields until we get to the envelope and we send documents in an envelope out for signature. Then I'm gonna scroll down and I'm gonna finish filling in all of the broker information here. Yes, you do have to fill this information out nearly every single time. For the 2021 documents, they're having conversations with DocuSign on having this information pre-populate since it will stay the same every single time. I'm just going to fill in my phone number here. I'm going to tab over and fill in my fax number, my license number. I'm a member of the Atlanta board, or MLS office code. License, office fax number. And then we are good to go. So now we have finished completing the listing agreement. Once you are done updating it, you can click save and close either at the very bottom of the document or in the top right hand corner, click save and close. All right, so now that we've done the listing agreement, we can walk through the seller's property disclosure. So I'll click on that to open it up. All right, so we see here, we don't have an offer date, so we leave that blank. The property address has already been added, so we're good to go here. And then we'll scroll down, and you'll see there are no boxes or radio buttons for us to fill in here on this document. And that is purposeful. For the seller's property disclosure, community association disclosure, and lead-based paint disclosure, there are no fields mapped to us as the agent to fill in. All of these fields are blank here in this part of DocuSign because they are all mapped for seller one to fill out when they sign these documents. So I just wanna quickly double check and make sure that there isn't anything that we're missing on these documents, but don't worry because you are not allowed to fill these out. So everything looks like it's good to go. Our client's names have auto-populated there. So I can click save and close. And now we'll do the same thing with the community association disclosure. Again, it's pre-populated our property address here. 
We don't need to fill in an exhibit number or letter. And I'll scroll down and you'll see, again, all these boxes and fields are blank because these are gonna be mapped for seller one to fill in. So I'm gonna to continue to scroll down just to make sure there's not anything that I'm missing. Perfect, we're good to go. So now I'll click save and close. So now that we filled in our listing agreement documents, let's walk through the purchase and sale. It's gonna be very similar, but just a little bit different. So I'm gonna open up that purchase and sale document here. All right. And again, let's just start at the top and we'll work our way down that document. So offer date, so we can put in today's dates of 10, 16, 2020. We have our property address here, our MLS number that was added directly from the details tab. We'll need to add our tax ID number. One, two, three, four. Well, uh, our legal description will be attached as an exhibit. Our purchase price, so we'll you know do, let's do 310, because we listed it at 315, we'll just offer 310 for today. Closing costs, we'll ask for 5,000. Uh, the closing date shall be, let's do 11, 16, 2020. I don't know what day of the week that is. Um, we'll take possession at closing. The holder of earnest money will be KWFA. Closing attorney will be Campbell and Brandon. Earnest money will be paid by check. And it will be, let's do 3,100 within three days of binding. Inspection will be 10 days. And you can see it's super easy just to go in and fill in these forms. It's very similar process to dot loop. Just scroll down and you fill in the information and, and check the right buttons. Uh, do, 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 was not, lead based paint was not built prior to 1978. You can see here for the brokerage relationships in this transaction, listing broker is Keller Williams First Atlanta. And this is one of those fields that I was mentioning that if it said Keller Williams Realty First Atlanta, it'd be too large for uh, this field. And I just need to check that I'm representing the seller as client. I can fill in here the selling broker. We can just do Harry Norman. And they are representing their buyer as client. There are no material relationships known. And the time limit of offer will be, let's do 11 a.m. on 10, 17, 2020. So we'll do you have 24 hours. And we'll scroll down and then make sure we're filling in all of the correct information. All right, so now we need to select our exhibit. So we'll have our community association disclosure and seller's property disclosure. I'd like the seller's property disclosure to be A, community association disclosure to be B. And then we can type in any special stipulations that we have here. I wanna point out that this box for special stipulations on the purchase and sale agreement doesn't take up the full space. And I don't know why that is. Um, if the special stipulations that you wanna include are you have too many to fit in this box you have two options one you can use the additional special stipulations page which is probably going to be the most simple option or you can wait and we can add the special stipulations in the envelope and when we're in the envelope we can actually edit the size of the text so we can select a smaller font so you can fit more just uh, stipulations in the same space so i'm just going to type in Stipulations, more steps, even more, lots of them, lots and lots. So I have my couple stipulations there. And we'll scroll down. And now we'll see that our clients, our seller's names and email addresses is included here on the purchase and sale agreement. Now, I personally do not like to include my client's contact information on any document I'm going to share with a co-op agent. However, like I said earlier, if you change or delete any information that is in a pre-populated field, it will delete or change that information from the details tab of the room. 
and will then affect all the other documents in the room. So if you delete your client's email address here, it will delete it from the room, and then you won't be able to email these documents out for signature. So leave the email addresses on this form, and then I will show you, <clears throat> excuse me, show you in the envelope how we can hide your client's email address. I'm sure that nine times out of 10, your co-op agent will be very respectful of your client relationship, but I know it's just a personal preference. I always like to uh, protect my client's information all the time. So I'll scroll down. And again, I need to fill in uh, the remainder in the remaining information for the brokerage. So my license number, fax number, realtor membership, office fax number, you know, probably not a requirement, but I always recommend that you include every piece of information, less of an opportunity for you to receive uh, feedback from compliance. Now, if you wanted to, and you wanted to be a, a nice co-op agent, you can go ahead and fill in your co-op agent's information over here. But again, I do not recommend sending this out for signature. So now that we have filled in all the information for our purchase and sale agreement, I'm gonna click save and close. So before we start preparing these documents to send for signature, are there any questions about what we've gone through so far uh, in the process? All right. So now that we have all of our documents prepared, we've updated them with all the correct information, we now need to send them out for signature. And to send documents out for signature, we create an envelope. The way Michael New explained envelopes to me was imagine if you uh, had physical paper copies of your documents and you went through with a pen and you filled them all in and then you organized them nicely and put them in a manila envelope and put it on the corner of your desk to wait till you saw your client the next time. Then when you saw your client, you would hand them that manila envelope and say, here are all these documents, please sign them. And envelopes in DocuSign work the same way. They are really just a vehicle of transferring those documents for signature. There are two ways in DocuSign that you can create envelopes. The first way is if you roll your mouse over a document and you select it, that the toolbar will appear. And if you roll your mouse over to the docu or to the create envelope button, which previously previously said DocuSign, but it now says create envelope. This will create an envelope for you with only the selected documents. So that's way number one. The second way you can create an envelope is by clicking into the envelopes tab. And in the top right hand corner, we'll click on new. And now we'll just kind of fill in all the information for our new envelope. Start at the top and work our way down. So envelope name. You're going to want to name your envelope something that you can keep track of. This is for you. This is not for your clients. Um, and you're going to send numerous envelopes throughout a transaction. Depending on your clients, you could send 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 envelopes. So make sure that you name them something that you can keep track of if you ever need to go back and reference when those documents were sent for signature. So I'm going to name it 1234 Main Street, uh, Listing Agreement, and Purchase and Sale Agreement. So now I know exactly what's in this envelope. Our next step is to add room docs. So we need to add the documents to the room. So I need to add those documents that we just updated. So I'll select room documents. And this is gonna show me all of the documents that are in my room that are available. When you first create your room, you're only gonna have a few documents in here. So it'd be really easy to select them because um, I wanna select all four of them. But as you are going throughout a transaction, when you have a lot of documents in here, you'll need to make sure that you select the correct document because it will be very easy to pick um, another version of the document or the incorrect version. So just be very mindful. So I'll click add selected. And it's now loaded those DocuSign forms into or those documents into my envelope. Now I also need to add in my affiliated marketing and wire fraud prevention uh, disclosures. 
So with First Atlanta, those are set up as templates. The reason they are set up as templates and not as documents is because there are no places or any fields on those documents for you to edit or for your clients to fill in. So they just need to be reviewed and signed. So to add that document to the envelope, I'm gonna click on use a template. Then I'm gonna click on shared with me and give it a second. And it's gonna pull up all of the documents that the MCA office has shared with the agents to use as templates. So I'm gonna scroll down and you'll see here, I have a buyer-affiliated marketing and buyer-wire fraud. And if I scroll down, you'll see I have a seller-affiliated marketing and seller-wire fraud. So there are two versions of these disclosures. The disclosures are the exact same. However, you wanna select the correct version based on which side of the transaction you're working on. And the reason is, is because those signature fields are gonna be mapped accordingly. So if you, incorrectly add for this uh, transaction, the buyer version, when you go to set up the signatures, there won't be any place for the, your clients to sign. So I'm gonna click on the seller affiliated marketing and, sell, and wire fraud, and then I'm gonna click add selected. So it's adding those templates. So now I have all of my documents that I wanna send out for signature, but you'll notice they're in alphabetical order and they're not in an order that I would want my clients to sign. So since I have my purchase and sale agreement included in this envelope, I want them to sign all of the listing agreements first and then sign the purchase and sale agreement. So to reorder the documents, you have to do it at this screen and this part of the process. To do that, click on, exclusive, click on the document you wanna move, click on it and drag it into the position that you want. So just pull the, listing agreement to be first, and then I want my seller's property disclosure to be second. Then we have my community association disclosure. So I want my affiliated marketing to go before that or after my community association. And then I want my wire fraud and then my purchase and sale. So now I have the documents in the order that I want. You are unable to reorder them once you get to the next screen. So make sure you put them in that order here. So scrolling down, now we add recipients to the envelope. So to click to add recipients, click on the add recipient button, and then you're gonna to wanna to select pre-tagged roles. It is very, very, very important that you select pre-tagged roles because all of those documents have signature fields and entry fields that are mapped to those roles. So for the disclosures, all of those fields to fill in the information about the home or the community association, are all gonna be mapped to seller one. If you do not select pre-tagged roles, your clients will not have any places to fill in because they will not be mapped correctly. So I'm gonna select pre-tagged roles. So here, I'm gonna select seller one, and I'm gonna select Tony for seller one. I'll select seller two, and then pick Pepper for seller two. And then for listing agent, I will select myself. Now your name will probably be in here twice and that's fine. You can pick either or. It's because you're included in the room as agent owner of the room, as well as the listing agreement that you are listing agent that you've added to the details tab. So I'm gonna select myself. And here's where I'm saying you do not wanna add your co-op agent. It may seem like, oh yeah, it'll be a great idea for me to add my buyer, the buyer's agent. Don't do that because when you send that document to the co-op agent and you're negotiating it, they're more than likely not gonna sign it, which then means your document will not be completed in your room. So do not send anything to a co-op agent through DocuSign. So I'm gonna click Add Selected. Now it's gonna add those recipients. We'll give it a second to load. Now there's a bit of information about um, our recipient box is here, so I wanna walk through all this information with you. To the left-hand side of each one of our recipients, there's a box with the number one in it. Those boxes determine the signing order of these documents. It will default to one for everybody, which means that when I send these documents out, everyone will have the ability to sign at the same time. 
However, there are going to be certain times when you want to have an order. So you have seller one, then seller two, and then your listing agent sign. Or maybe you want to be the first person to sign before it goes to your clients. To edit the signing order, just click your mouse into that box and update the number that you want. And you'll see here, it now has Tony as one, myself as one, but I want to be the last person to sign. So I'm going to click three, click out of it. And now it's reordered to Tony to be uh, seller one or signer one, and then Pepper to be signer two, and then listing agent myself to be signer three. Here's their name and email addresses as they are in the details tab. So I just want to double check and make sure that is correct. Then here where it says need to sign and there's a drop down menu. And this is where we can change the different roles and responsibilities of these recipients. It's going to default to needs to sign, which means they need to sign the document. Needs to view means that they just need to view it. They don't have to do anything to it. Receives a copy. You may want to do this if you want to, if you know your document's going binding and you can include your closing attorney or your lender partner on the uh, email chain. So that way, as soon as everyone signs, they would receive a copy. Now you want to make sure that your lender and uh, attorney partners have a heads up that they're going to be receiving the documents that way and not through an email or specify recipient. More than likely, nine times out of 10, you can just leave it as need to, needs to sign. And then to the right of that, we have a more dropdown. And this is, uh, gives us the option to add an access authentication code. So if you have a client that is very hesitant about e-signing, adding an access authentication code is an extra level of security that they will have to have before the system will allow them to sign. So to do that, click on the add access authentication and then this little box will pop up here and then you can just type in a code. You can make it whatever code you want. And then I would let Tony know, hey Tony, before you're able to sign it with a DocuSign, you need to type in one, two, three, four, five. That way someone couldn't hack into his email, then click review documents to start signing and then go under contract on a house that Tony doesn't know about. But I don't need that today, so I'm gonna click discard. And then the other option we have is to add a private message. And this is going to be beneficial if you want to send a note specifically to one person and not everyone. So for Tony, he's seller one, so he's going to be responsible for filling in the seller's property disclosure and the community association disclosure. So I'm going to write him a note and say, hi, Tony. Please be sure to fill in the SPD and CAD. Thank you. Nick. I just want to have that quick reminder for him. So now we have our recipients. We have our seller one, seller two. Let's say, for instance, you're in a situation where you need to have more than two signers. Here's where you can add an additional signer. To do that, you'd click add recipient, and then you would select email address. And then you can type in your uh, your name, so I'll just name this additional signer, and this will be email address of fake email at gmail.com. And this is how you'd add that additional signer. Now, I don't want to actually include that today because it will affect um, actually signing the documents that we're going to have for as examples. And um, I don't want to do that. So that is how you would do it yourself if you wanted to. So I'm going to click X here to remove this signer. So now I have all my recipients in the correct order. Oh, why is this not removed? There we go. Perfect. So we have our signers in all the correct order. Now we can scroll down to add a message to the recipients. The default email subject will be please DocuSign. I recommend you leave that so that way your clients know that they have a DocuSign document waiting for them. But then you wanna update it so they know exactly what it is they are signing. Main Street, and this will be the listing agreement and purchase and sale agreement. Hi, Tony. And Pepper, please review and sign documents. Thank you, Nick. Perfect. So once you have named your envelope, 
You've added all of the correct documents and put them in the, the correct order. You've added all of uh, your signers and written a message. You can click on next in the top right hand corner. And this is gonna take us to the docu the envelope editor. And there's gonna be a bit of information that we're gonna walk through here before we do anything. In the top left hand corner, there's a button that says go back. If for whatever reason you need to go back to the envelope or to adjust the document, you'd click on this button here. DocuSign does uh, save the document as you make edits to it here with the signature fields every couple se seconds, so it should save it for you. Below that, we have a drop down menu. You can see it says Tony Stark and it has a yellow circle next to it. If you click on that drop down menu, you'll see all of the signers have a name and a color assigned to them. And that is to let you know uh, which fields are assigned to which signers. So you can see here, it's uh, Tony is yellow. So all of these fields here are yellow. So if I add any of these fields, they would automatically be assigned to Tony. If I wanna change that to Pepper, now everything is blue. So that way I can easily, easily identify which fields are assigned to Pepper. Here are all the different fields, uh, signature, initial, date, sign, name, email, company, and text fields. These are gonna be your most commonly used fields. Most of them will be pre-populated for you, but if you need to add in any of them, you'd add them here. In the middle here, we have a preview, so that way we can go through, double check all the information, make sure it's correct, and make sure that all of the signature fields are mapped correctly. Over here on the right-hand side, we have thumbnail versions of each one of the documents, so you can click through to see thumbnails of the documents. And on the thumbnails, there are little sticky notes here in the top corner with a color, and that's to let you know that on this document, on this page, this, there's a person that is assigned to sign here. So yellow we know is Tony, so I know that Tony has a responsibility on this page. Then if I scroll down, I can see Tony and Pepper both have a responsibility on this last page. So now that we have a lay of the land, let's go through all the documents and make sure everything is set up correctly. So let's kind of start at the top and work our way down and make sure everything is mapped correctly. Perfect, everything looks good so far. Now, the reason you wanna double check, nine times out of 10, everything will be mapped correctly and you'll be good to go. However, there will be some instances where some of the signature fields are messed up or you need to add one or remove one and you wanna make sure you do that. Here we have all of our brochures checked, our exhibits, our special stipulations, and then we scroll down. We can see here that we have Tony and Pepper are both already assigned uh, for signature. And if I scroll down, I'm assigned for signature as well. So we're good to go here for the listing agreement. Now for the listing agreement, since this is not going to co-op agent, I can set this document as binding based on when I sign because I'm gonna be the last signer. So to do that, what I can do is I can come up here to the dropdown, select myself, and then I can add a text box here to this field. Format that. I can add another text box here and format that this to fit. And then I can add a date sign field here and it'll automatically add the date of when I sign. Because one of the benefits of DocuSign is after everyone signs it, it sends out all the forms for everyone to have copies of them. So by doing this, I can make this document binding so that I don't have to come back into it, make a binding and resend out for notice to everybody. You'll notice when you click on one of these fields, the, a menu pops up on the right hand side and it's gonna default to required. That means the system is gonna stop me when I'm signing to make sure I fill in this text box. And I wanna leave it at that for this stage. So I'm gonna click back into the documents and we're gonna to continue to scroll down. And now we're in our seller's property disclosure. And you can see here, all of these boxes are highlighted yellow and that lets me know that they are all assigned to Tony Stark. But what you do notice here is that the required field isn't checked. That means that when Tony is signing and reviewing these documents, it, the system will not stop him 
on the seller's property disclosure to fill in the information. I would recommend that you give your clients a heads up that says, hey, when you're signing these documents, the system will just jump from required field to required field and will jump right over all the fields that you need to fill in. Make sure that you scroll back up to fill that information in before you click finish. Another trick of what you can do to prevent that from happening is if you select for uh, on the seller's property disclosure, what year was the main residential dwelling constructed, select that text box and then make this required. And by making this field required, the system will stop and Tony will have to fill in this information and then we'll make it much easier for him to go through and fill it in because he doesn't have to scroll back up. So just a quick trip, uh, quick tip to help you with that. Because nine times out of 10, when I hear back from agents and say, hey, I sent my disclosures out, but my client said they weren't able to fill them in, it's usually just that they didn't realize that they had to scroll back up to fill in the information. All right, so I'm gonna continue to scroll down. Everything looks good here. All these fields are mapped for Tony as seller one. Continuing to scroll. Scrolling, perfect. And then the signature fields and date signed are already added correctly, so we're good to go. Our next document is a community association disclosure, and this is the same thing. None of these fields are gonna be required for Tony to fill in, but I do wanna make sure that the system stops. And I don't know which type of association Tony has, so I don't wanna make any of these boxes required, but what I can do is I can come here to name of association, click on that text box and make this a required field, and it'll be the same thing where the system will stop uh, for Tony to fill in this information. So I'm gonna continue to scroll through. All right, and our initials for our clients are here, so we're good to go. Now we're gonna go through the, mark, uh, the affiliated marketing disclosure. Now for whatever reason here, our seller's initials are, excuse me, seller client signatures are not here, so we need to add those. So I'll come up to the drop down menu, I'll select Tony, I'll click on the signature field and add that right here. And then I'm also gonna add the date sign box right here. So I still have a quick question. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Yes, Jeannie, that is where you would add um, the executor for your client senior. And then I also need to add Pepper as a signer here. So I'll click signature, put that there, and then date signed and add that right here. Perfect. So now when they go through, they'll be able to sign these documents. Now we'll get to the wire fraud prevention notice. And you can see here for whatever reason, and I don't know why the system does it, it shifts the signature field down so you just wanna fix that real, fit, uh, real quickly. And then we have our name and date signed. And you'll see here this full name box. What that will do, it'll automatically add the client's full name when they go to sign it. So that you don't have to worry about typing that in. So I'm gonna scroll down. Here we have our purchase and sale. Everything looks good to go. All right. We have our initial fields over here in the seller box. Keep scrolling. And then we'll get to our special stipulations in just a moment. So earlier I had told you how, uh, if you need to add additional stipulations, you can do that here with the text box. And if you wanna do that, you can select yourself from the drop down, and then click on text box then you can add a text box here and size it to fill in the whole space. Then you can start typing in stipulations, steps, steps, lots, 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 even more, more, more. So you can see I added way too many stipulations here, so many that they won't fit. Well, what you can do is if you select all of the text within that field, you can come over here to the menu for that text field, click on formatting, and you can make the font size seven font. And now all the stipulations will fit. 
Another thing you'll want to do is scroll back up to the top of this menu and we'll want to uncheck required field and make it read only. By making this text field read only, this text field will show up when every single person signs the document. So that way when seller one reviews it, they'll see this text here. I do want to warn you that by having seven point font on a purchase and sale agreement, it's probably not going to make uh, any big fans from your closing attorney or lender or a co-op agent, but it is a way that you can fit more stipulations on this page. Scrolling down, we'll get to our signature fields. And here I, show, I told you that I'd be, show you how to hide your client's email addresses. So before you send any co-op, any document to a co-op agent, you'll want to hide your client's email addresses. And to do that, you'll want to click on the markup tools icon on the far left, which looks like a pen, and then click on line. And then we'll just drag that line across the client's email address. And then in the menu on the right hand side, we'll select color, click black, and then thickness. We'll want to make that all the way 10, 10 point thickness. And you can see that perfectly hides your client's email address. Then what you can do is you can right mouse click on it, select copy, right mouse click, paste, and then you can drag this text box or this black box over, excuse me, seller two, seller two's information. So now no one will be able to see their email address. Scrolling down, everything looks good to go. So now once we are done, we can click send in the top or bottom right hand corners. But before that, we can click on recipient preview. And what this will do is it will allow us to see what our clients will see when they go to sign. So I can select uh, my client, Tony. So now I'll be able to see what, it, what he will see when he goes to sign these documents. You can select desktop, uh, iPad, <clears throat> so this is what it would look like for your client to sign on an iPad or what it would look like for them to sign on a mobile device. So if they're at a dinner, if your clients are at dinner, you can say, hey, you can sign. It's going to be really difficult to read, but if we just click through and click sign on everything, we'll be good to go. And then you can click start and kind of go through the process. So once you're good there on the recipient preview, you can click the X in the top right hand corner. And now I'm going to click send and send this envelope out for signature. So the first person that's going to receive this email will be Tony. So I'm going to log into um, Tony's account in just a second. So if you let me log into that. So here we have our KWFA tech email. And you can see here I have an email. Please DocuSign 1234 Main Street. Just sent. And I'll scroll down. You'll see here is my private message to Tony. It says, Tony, please be sure to fill in the SPD and CAD. Thank you. So I'm going to click on review documents. Your client's going to click, I agree to use electronic records and signatures, continue, start. And now the system is going to jump to that first required field. Click sign. It's going to ask to confirm the signature, adopt and sign. And then it's going to jump to that next required field, which we had set up to be what was the main, what year was the main dwelling, main dwelling constructed. So we can type in 2004. And now because Tony is right here, he can just kind of start going through here and checking these boxes. You can type in here, covenants and fees. Yes, yes. I'm just going to click through here and just select a bunch of boxes. And I want to do that because I want to show you that when seller two goes to sign, when Pepper signing, she'll be able to see all of the information that Tony has added, which is beneficial because it can give her a chance to double check, make sure everything's correct. So I don't want to fill it all out for the sake of time. So let's scroll down. And I can just select some of these here. So I, we can get some more on this page. All right. 
Perfect. So I'll scroll down, click sign. And now we're at the community association disclosure and it does the same thing where it will stop Tony. So Tony will be required to fill in the uh, name of HOA. And then he can easily scroll up to see, oh, we have a mandatory home, homeowners association and it's a thousand dollars and it's paid in two installments. And then we can scroll back through here and fill in all this information correctly. And this includes a pool, a tennis courts, a clubhouse, and a playground. There we go. And then he can click sign, 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 initial, sign. And you can see his information is blacked out there. And now once your client has uh, signed everything, make sure they click on the finish button, either at the bottom of the page or the top right hand corner. DocuSign will ask them if they want to set up an account. They don't need to do that. They can click no thanks. And they need to wait till they get to the you're all done page. This is how, you, this is how they will know that they have signed everything they need to sign. And then now it'll go on to the next person. If, if signer one does not get the you're all done page, signer two will never have the opportunity to sign. So I'm gonna close out of DocuSign. And I'm gonna open up the email for Pepper, which is just my personal one. You can see here, I have a, my please DocuSign. Hi, Tony and Pepper, please review and sign documents. Now you'll notice Pepper doesn't have that private message because I did not include her on that. I'll click review documents. Agree to use electronic records and signatures. Continue. Start. We'll jump to the first required signature page. Confirm signature. Now it's scrolled all the way to the bottom of the seller's property disclosure, but if you scroll up, you can see all that information that Tony filled in. So, she can just double check it all, make sure everything looks good to go, and she can sign. Same thing with the HOA, or CAD, you double check all the information was filled in here. Initial, sign, sign, initial, sign, and now Pepper can click finish. We don't need to set up an account for her, no thank you. And now Pepper has received the you're all done. So I'm gonna click into my email and now I have an email that says please DocuSign. So it's my turn to sign, I'll click review documents. Click continue, start, sign. Now remember I get to make this uh, listing agreement binding so I'm gonna set this to be accepted at 11 a.m today, so I filled it in, sign, and now I'm good, I can click finish. I don't need to log in, I already have it open on another window. So now, one of the great things about DocuSign is that it will automatically send out the completed versions for everyone to see. So you see here, we have our completed email, and the completed documents attached below. So that's just one less thing that you have to do for um, your clients. So now I'm gonna go back into DocuSign. I'm gonna refresh the page so you can see that the envelope shows as completed. Then I'm gonna go into the documents tab here. And all those signed documents now have a green check mark on them and they are, um, in the room docs folder. So now we need to add all, move those documents to the listing agreement folder. So I'm gonna select all the listing agreement documents. Oh, I did not mean to open that up. And I'm gonna click move, select destination, folder in current room, 
listing agreements, and then click move. So now I have all of my listing agreement documents in the listing agreement folder, and then my purchase and sale document in the room docs folder. So now that we have all of our documents signed, now we need to upload them for compliance. So I'm gonna go back into command. Um, in the listed folder, I'm gonna to come to the listing agreement document, and I'm gonna click on add a file. And then for source of documents, I'm gonna select DocuSign. And that's gonna pull up all the documents that I have available in DocuSign. And you can see it organizes them by the folders that I've set up. So I can select the exclusive seller listing agreement signed, and then click assign. Now I can scroll down here. I can do the same thing for the community association disclosure. But if you have to add multiple documents, you can do that here by clicking attach multiple files, and then select DocuSign, and it's gonna pull up all those documents from within DocuSign, so I can select community association disclosure, so I'd select Community Association Disclosure, Signed. Do the same thing for the Seller's Property Disclosure. I have a quick question. Oh, sorry, Charlotte, I don't know why my screen is freezing. Uh, can you just do me a favor and go back over there again? Yeah, Thanks. so if you wanna attach multiple files and you don't wanna to have to go add them one by one. You can click on attach multiple files up here. And then we'll select DocuSign as the source and it will pull up all those connected files. So I can come up here over here to the community association disclosure and I can select that from the dropdown and I'll make sure that I attach the signed version. Do the same thing for the seller's property disclosure. A signed version right here. We'll do Rawls Group Affiliated Marketing, signed, and then the Wire Fraud Prevention, signed, and then click Attach. Now, once you have uploaded all of your documents for your listing, you can click on the Submit to MC button. That is what's going to send those documents for Lynn and Alita to review. And that is the process. That is it for DocuSign. Any questions on anything that we went over so far this morning? Can we go in and when we have these files in DocuSign, can we go ahead and put in information like our information, you know, license numbers, all that kind of stuff, or we have to do that new every time? So the answer is yes and no. So yes, you could set up templates that would have that you could fill in that information for yourself ahead of time. However, that kind of complicates the process and I do a separate training on templates if you're interested in that. Uh, otherwise, you would have to fill it in every single time. Now for the 2020, 2021 version, uh, Hutch has mentioned that he's talking with uh, DocuSign to have those fields automatically filled in since it's going to stay the same every single time someone logs in and uses a form. Nick. Yeah. Okay. If I am selling a property that the sellers have never lived in, I know I don't have to do a seller's property disclosure, but can I fill out the community association disclosure? Um. I'm going to refer you, that to Lynn and Alita because that's going to get into a compliance question. Okay. Okay. Does we do it? Yes. There's going to be some workarounds, but since we're not supposed to, and then you'd be right. You right. know, I would just right. talk to Lynn or Alita about that. Okay. And maybe after this class, I've just discovered that I do need to add all three people on all my documents. So could you help me with that after the class is over? Uh, yeah, that should be fine. Okay, thank you. Any other questions?
All right. Well, if there aren't any other questions, I'm going to let you guys go. Have a great rest of your day and a great weekend. And as you're working in DocuSign, please do not hesitate to reach out with any questions. Give me a call. I'd rather us jump on a five-minute call and figure out what your problem is uh, versus holding up, potentially submitting uh, an offer. So have a great weekend, and I will talk with you all soon.